Guild Wars, Sea of Sorrows. Chapter 18 The central building of Lion's Arch was a long, well-built pavilion on the eastern cliffs with a magnificent view of the harbor. It was sturdy, built from the hull of a large galleon and constructed to weather even the coldest of severe winter storms. Since the flooding, the tides and the weather in Lion's Arch had never been quite the same. Meaner, some said. More protective, Kopaya would reply. The storms made the winter harbor even more difficult to navigate without the tugboats. That kept the dead ships away and gave the city a season of relative rest. To Kobaya, it felt as if the goddess Duena were watching over them in the winter time. Of course, he'd never say that to the Char. After escorting Kobaya to the council building, Sikox had returned to the Pride to take his bundle of tools and equipment aboard. Each captain was allowed to bring one crew member as aid to the council meetings. Kobaya had learned from experience that bringing any of the Char, even Fasher or Sikox, only caused trouble. Neither had the patience for long meetings. Too many brunches, not enough fighting. Sikox would grumble. Macha, on the other hand, actually enjoyed going with him. She was already inside the foyer of the pavilion, waiting for him, tapping her foot in sullen annoyance. Macha's braids were still dyed all the colors of the rainbow, but in recent years, she'd exchanged her blue feather robe for a plainer set of clothing. She wore a turquoise bracelet around the top of one arm, a mark of her advancement in the Aseron Colleges. Genius first grade. Its inscriptions matched the markings of Macha's invention, a navigational tool she had titled the Sextant. The first Norn who laughed at the name found himself unable to speak properly for a week. Regardless of that, the instrument had so revolutionized navigation that the city had named a section of the docks after her. Macha's Landing. Macha glared at him. You're late, she said grumpily. I got stuck talking to Nodobi for ten minutes. Ten minutes with that pompous, self-absorbed nincompoop is worse than three days in the doldrums with no wind. How could you do that to me? Sorry. I had a little problem with Yam. Kobaya paused outside the big pavilion lowering his voice so passers-by wouldn't overhear. By the way, he might come talk to you. Is this about Grimjaw and his warband? She raised an eyebrow inquisitively. I've heard rumors they're running up tabs and then leaving town. Sometimes it takes months for them to come back. And when they do, they argue the charges before they settle up for the minimum possible. Now, I'm sure Yam's charging them an arm and a leg above everyone else but I don't blame him for being angry. Angry is one thing, but Yam's threatening to shut down the store. Macha paused at that, cocking an eyebrow. Is he now? Hmm. He might do it if he's mad enough. Can we stop him? Is it going to go that badly? She replied. Kobaya sighed. Worse, I think. Yam wants to set prices according to each ship, so he can charge Grimjaw's crew more. Grimjaw wants standard prices for everyone. Most of the other captains will vote with Grimjaw. Yam won't like it, but we'll just have to find a way to deal with him. Macha's expression darkened like a small thundercloud. Don't underestimate Yam. He's dangerous, Kobe. So's a ship full of char. Do you want to tell Grimjaw that we're going to let Yam gouge the captains? Macha's ears twitched as she spun the issue around in her head. At last, the Asura tossed her rainbow hair and sighed. Nothing we can do about it out here. Best get inside, Kobe, before the other captains vote to hang us while we're not there. Kobaya chuckled and started walking again, Macha toddling along at his side. Always practical. How late are we? We are not late. Macha smirked. You are late. I've already been inside, so they know I'm here. They walked into the main chamber of the building, where a single long table stretched the length of the room. It could have easily seated thirty people. Today, there were only seven, plus an equal number of aides, seven of the fifteen ships whose captains had invested in the city. Kobaya's contribution had been the largest, 
but these captains had each bought a seat on the council so that they could have a say in the city's management. When the beacons were lit, they made their way to Lion's Arch. Today, these captains would set the law. Four captains were already seated at the table. One was the elegant Captain Nodobe, his dark skin shining in the sunlight that streamed through the pavilion's high windows. Grimjaw reclined in a chair farther down the table, speaking to his first officer in low growls. Kobaya recognized the other char as the burliest of those escorting the legionnaire that morning. Captain Hedda was also at the table, a broad Norn woman whose flabby arms disguised her well-known strength. She was renowned for lifting the entire prow of her ship from the shore and shoving it into the sea during an unexpected low tide. Although the rumor was greater than the truth, it wasn't much of an exaggeration. The last of the four at the table was old Captain Moran, previously of the Salma's Grace. After retiring from the Creodon military, he'd used his severance to purchase a small clipper of his own, which he'd named the Valor. He'd stayed on good terms with Kobaya and the others over the years and spent more time than not in Lion's Arch. Moran was the only captain who smiled when Kobaya entered the room. A small cluster of other individuals stood at the far end of the room. One was an Asura, bigger and more muscular than most of his people, carrying a heavy warhammer across his back. His name was Captain Tarb, a relative newcomer to the council. His first mate was with him, a petite human woman named Gamina, only slightly taller than the burly Asura. Gamina was slender, with a snub nose and honey-colored hair. Kobaya didn't know much about either of them, other than their ship's name, the Priority Divide. It was an odd name for a vessel, and Kobaya didn't get it. But Macha assured him that the name was extremely meaningful to the Asura of Rata Sum. Neither of them held Kobaya's attention once his eyes fell on the final captain in the room. She was a human woman, tall and athletic, with her dark mane pulled back in a simple ponytail. Hazel eyes caught the sun as she turned her head, and her lips turned up into a charming smile. Clearly, she was as happy to see him as he was to lay eyes on her. Oh, great, Maya groaned, ruining the moment. Isai brought the buka. Indeed, Henst was standing beside Isai, wearing his typical gear, two swords and a scowl. He placed his traveling rucksack in a corner of the room and took his place standing behind Isaiah's chair. It was as if Henst's presence sucked all the joy out of the room, dimming even the sunlight. Henst had served on the Pride for a short time, but difficulties with the char and a dislike for being thrown overboard made him leave the ship for other work. Yet he stayed in touch with Isaiah, and when she commissioned the Nomad, he joined her aboard as first mate. Predictable. When Isais had a good journey, she brings Varid. Macha hopped into the main chamber, keeping her voice low so that only Kobaya could hear her speaking. She has a bad one. And we get stuck with the squall, Kobaya said, finishing Macha's sentence with a sigh. Ignoring Henst's scowl, Kobaya crossed the room to greet Isai. But he'd made it only halfway there when a resounding voice boomed out from the big table. Ah, there you are, Captain Mariner. Sidubo Nodabe spoke without rising from his chair, but his thundering basso voice rumbled in the pavilion. We feared you were forced to abandon the meeting. There was no other voice like that in all of Lion's Arch, possibly in all of Criada. Nodobe was Elonian by birth, and when he spoke, it was with a flair for oratory and the distinct, ringing timber of the people of Vabi. It was too bad that the warm color of his skin and the generous tone of his voice didn't reach the man's features. Nodobi's smile was brilliant, but his eyes were cold and sharp. I wouldn't miss the meeting, Captain Nodobe, Kobaya replied formally. I, and the Pride, are here to serve Lion's Arch. Kobaya curved his path toward the table trying not to let his voice reveal his annoyance. Isay nodded and strode toward the table as well. Their hellos would just have to wait. Then we are fortunate, for today, Lion's Arch needs you. And here you are, 
ready to face the many problems plaguing our town. Nodbobi spread his hands in welcome. Kobaya stopped himself from obviously looking between the man's fingers for a hidden knife. Nodobi smoothly took control of the meeting, directing everyone's attention as if he were wholly, smilingly in charge. Although it rankled, Kobaya wasn't going to let the man see his irritation. He smiled and took a seat, waiting for the others to gather around the table. Once the last of the captains was seated, Kobaya spoke up before Nodobe could get started. Lion's Arch is growing more rapidly than we expected. The larger the city becomes, the more we will be a target of dead ships, pirates, and other predators. Raiders already patrol the roads from here to the Shiver Peaks, seeking to take out easy prey. We need to capitalize on the natural defenses of our location and build more. We need to put those guns on the North Cliff. Finish the fortress in the bay. Claw Island? Nodobi's laugh was condescending. A doomed undertaking. The sooner we abandon it in favor of realistic improvements, the more certain it is that our little town... He spread his ebony hands, revealing dusky palms, will grow into something mighty. Mighty? Macha's eyebrows shot up like hovering seagulls. What do you mean, mighty? A force to be reckoned with. Nodobi lowered his hands and pressed the palms against the table. Prosperous. Strong. Independent. Isn't that what we all want? Point of order. Tarb, the burly Asura with the warhammer, wrapped his knuckles on the table. Seconds are not allowed to contribute unless directly requested. Macha, be quiet or leave the room. He fixed Macha with an icy gaze, and she returned it in kind. Behind Tarb, Gamina gulped and stared at the floor, shifting from foot to foot in a nervous sort of dance. Agreed. Kobaya made no apology for Macha's outburst. He kept his eyes on Nodobi and said, The simple fact of the matter is that unless we defend the port, it won't matter how prosperous the businesses are in Lion's Arch. There'll be rubble. Nodi shook his head. Kobaya, you're overestimating the threat. The town has survived several attacks in the last six years. We can easily survive more. Our defenses are already adequate. Is there such a thing as an adequate defense against the dragons? Hada, the heavyset Norn woman, tapped long fingernails on the table. She'd painted them red, possibly with the blood of her enemies but more likely with a bucket of ship's primer. Farther down the table, Moran sounded unconvinced. The town's been attacked, all right, but by small groups of ships. Not a full-on assault like the one that destroyed Port Stalwart. No one's been to R and returned. We don't know what they might throw against us. There's no proof the dead ships are the worst thing Orr can bring to bear. Hedda frowned. They're puny, rotten wrecks. Grimjaw ran his claws through the fur on his forearm in an idle gesture. You're scared of ships that barely sail and gunnery that barely fires. The Orions are about as efficient as a devourer with a torch between its tails. Perhaps, Notobi said. We know that nothing we do will stop them from raiding. But we've also seen that Aryan ships seek out locations they can overwhelm. They'll choose an easier target than Lion's Arch. Hylic villages along the coast. The smaller, private docks at the edge of the Maguma jungle. Perhaps the Cretan's new dock at Port Noble. We won't be their first choice. That's your argument? Let them kill somebody other than us? Kobaya said, mocking him. These are walking corpses. They're not ogres or grawl. They don't get weaker with every attack. They get stronger. With each battle, they add more undead to their ranks and more firepower to their armada. An awkward silence settled over the table as each captain pondered this point of view. I don't agree with either of you. Make more money? Foe, build more walls to hide behind. Bah. I say we buy enough ships to storm or and destroy the dragon that lives there once and for all. Anything else is just wasting our time. Grimjaw snarled, his long canines glinting hungrily. Cowards, both of you. He glared at Kobaya and Nodobi. 
You humans have got to get your fingers out of your noses and try to find your spines. That's uncalled for. I say his voice was loudest among the chorus of captains shouting Grimjaw down. The table erupted into catcalls and shreds of arguments. Captain Tarb finally pounded his fist on the table and raised his bellow over the others, shouting them into silence so he could speak. In my three years docking at Lion's Arch, Tarb barked loudly. I've heard nothing but Island Fortress this and ultimate protection. That? Kobaya, you say these defenses are critically important, but you also say they'll take years to finish. How long can we sit around waiting for stone and lumber, construction and shoring, before we turn our attention to a better market plaza? Or hire more guards to keep our ships and cargo safe? I'm all for keeping those monsters out of our harbor, but I'm not willing to wait ten years to build a bank. Nodobi leaned back in his wicker chair. A bank is extremely necessary to the town's growth, Tarb. You're quite correct. Port Noble doesn't have a bank, so we'd be solidifying our place as a preferred port for neutral shipping concerns. Traders interested in dealing with bulk goods, or large sums, would be more likely to come to Lion's Arch. Kobaya grabbed the table's attention, not wanting to give the smooth-spoken Elonian an opportunity to sway the audience. Moran, he tossed in quickly. You're quiet. What are your thoughts? I'm thinking that most of you are blind idiots, to tell the truth. Ever blunt, old Moran sighed and scratched his scalp beneath his thick shock of gray hair. All plans and no foundation. Where's the money to pay for the defenses, or the bank, or the attack ships? Or, by the mists, your furless Aunt Maybell's parlor house, if that's what the town needs. Every one of you is snapping jaw about how you're going to spend money, but nobody said word one about how we're going to get it. I believe I can help with that. A smarmy voice from the doorway made Kobaya turn sharply in his chair. The voice came from Yom, the Asuran merchant. With a smug tilt to his chin, Yom trotted toward the long table. He wasn't alone either. A Norn was with him, walking slowly so as to keep pace with the merchant. With a start, Kobaya recognized the Norn as Bronn Svard. Further, Bronn was carrying a sack over his shoulder, much like the one Sikox had been carrying earlier that morning. But this sack was not filled with machine parts and engine tools. Bronn dropped it on the table at an insistent wave of Yom's hand, and the entire group heard the unmistakable clink-clink of coins. I'm here to buy a seat at the table. Yom's long ears flicked back determinedly. He met each captain's eye with unflinching resoluteness, defying them to say no. Everyone froze for a moment, shocked by the shopkeep's brass. This was unheard of. Yom, you blithering idiot, Grimjaw snorted. You're no captain. You've no ship. Don't waste our time with this scale-headed bilge. Shooting the arrogant char a black look, Kobaya tried to soften the blow. I know you're worried about the discussion on fixed prices, Yom, but he's right. The law says you must be an established captain before you can pay the regency fee and join the council. You think I don't know that? The Asura's green eyes narrowed haughtily. He rounded on Grimjaw without fear. It so happens that I've purchased a ship, you slack-jawed mouth-breather. Her name is the Nadir Shill. And, before you insult my intelligence any further, I've hired a crew as well. He has, Braun added blithely. He's hired me and my brother, Grim. Only two? Grimjaw guffawed. Smallest crew ever. What are you sailing, yum? A cork with a toothpick mast? That's no business of yours, mongrel. Stiffening at the char's laughter, Yom nevertheless waved the argument away. I've obeyed the law in letter and spirit. I've brought the entire regency fee in cash, and my first mate to boot. You can't keep me out any longer. Not entirely true, Yom. Issei's voice was serenely neutral. Kobaya was grateful for her ability to stay calm. It was a rarity among the captains of Lion's Arch. She continued, There's one more thing. 
you also need the approval of a majority of the council in session. Well, by the mists, he's got mine. Moran stared at the bulging sack of money. That coin will go far toward any of the plans you lot have proposed. So I'm all for it. The old captain was clearly amused by the discomfort around the table. He's got my vote. Nodobi thoughtfully rubbed his clean-shaven jaw. The laws of the town are clear, and the shopkeep has obeyed them. Even if we don't like his methods, we cannot deny that Yam already has a great deal of investment in the city. I suppose. Very well. I accept him in our number. Dubious, Kobaya frowned. Well, I don't. He glared at Yam angrily. Look, Yam. If we allow anyone with coin and a seaworthy bathtub to buy their way onto the council, the city's going to be overrun by greedy profiteers. Maybe King Bade will send a hundred captains to buy seats, and then vote to annex Lion's Arch back into Criada. The idea spawned several uncertain grumbles around the table, and he added, Yum! You're only doing this to get back at Grimjaw. You don't care about the city. You just want power. I find that unacceptable. My vote is no. By the Connor's metal claws, I actually agree with a human. Grimjaw snorted, his dark stripes rippling with amusement. Leaning back, he thumped one boot and then the other onto the table's surface, tail flicking in annoyance. I vote we don't let the little gouger make idiots of us all. And I still say we go attack, or... Kobaya wasn't sure he enjoyed being on the same side as the arrogant Char. With a sigh, he looked toward Hedda and Tarb and tried to predict their reactions. Hedda looked thoughtful, eyes lingering on the money satchel with obvious interest. Tarb, on the other hand, never stopped staring at Yum. His expression was difficult to read, but his ears flicked back and forth against his shoulders as if twitching away a wasp. I suppose, Hedda said at last, we could see our way clear to accepting his regency and allowing Yum on the council. She shrugged, the motion rippling down her fleshy arms. What harm can a little thing like him cause? It's not like he's buying the whole city. The rest of us can disagree with him in council. That's two no's and three yeses, Kobaya tallied. Tarb, Isai. Tarb sat in silence, arms crossed over his chest. When he realized all eyes were on him, the Asara captain grumbled under his breath and shifted belligerently in his seat. At last, he proclaimed simply, I vote no. His lips twisted in sour disapproval. Tarb's dynamics, like me, Macha whispered conspiratorially into Kobaya's ear. Yam's statics. Kobaya turned and gave her a blank stare. Colleges, she prompted. When Kobaya's face remained expressionless, Macha clenched her fists to her ears in frustration. Asarin colleges? They have fierce rivalries. It's a well-established fact in a Surin society that we sabotage each other whenever given the opportunity. Colby, don't you ever listen to my stories when we're at sea? I listen to the ones where stuff blows up. He grinned unhelpfully. Macha squeezed her eyes shut and muttered something under her breath. He turned toward Asai and asked, Three and three. Your vote will decide, Isai. Isai ignored their whispers. Thoughtfully, she stated, You aren't a sailor, Yom. I understand your dissatisfaction with the process, but it doesn't change the reasons we chose captains to run it and not the townsfolk. Captains are capable of commanding a crew in life-threatening situations. Lion's Arch is under threat from Orion attack. Only those who can and have put their lives on the line against the dead ships have the right to make decisions for this port. We pay for that right in more than gold. Many of us have paid for it with the blood of our sailors. I could be useful against the dead ships. Yom blustered. Angrily, he rushed on. Sailing isn't everything. I could import weaponry for the townsfolk. That doesn't help us, I say repeated gently, shaking her head. Orions come from the sea. We need ships in the harbor to defend the village. 
invested captains who can and will fight for the town where we need it the most. Villagers flailing about with swords aren't going to stop a dead ship's attack. Yum, you don't sail. You're not a real captain. I don't sail, hum. Yom crossed his arms, and his tone turned nasty. I, well. Suddenly struck with inspiration, Yom jabbed a finger toward Kobaya. Ha, huh, neither does he. When was the last time anyone saw the Pride leave the harbor? Half of her crews out on other ships or looking for work. Like you, Isai, with that cryodan tub of yours. Or this big buka. Yom jerked a thumb toward Braun, ignoring the Norn's snort of surprise. Kobaya Mariner spends all his time in the city. Everyone knows his engineer's insane, his crew's disbanded, and his first mate's a murderous scallywag who's been in more fights than a drunken script. If Kobaya's your idea of a real captain, then by the sparks and Aetherians of the eternal alchemy, I'm one too. Yom tossed his head and dared the council to disagree. A mutter ran through the group, and at the head of the table, Nodobi laughed out loud. Heat flushed Kobaya's face. Before he could stammer an indignant reply, Tarb sighed with annoyance and sat back in his chair. Yom's got a point, the Asura said grudgingly. The captains erupted into shouts, yelling opinions one over the other. Hedda banged a fist on the table, shutting them all up. Captain Issei hasn't voted yet. Let her speak. The rest of you, shove it in your brig and let her talk. She placed her hands on the table, red-painted nails scraping like claws against the hard wood. Well, Isai? The room fell silent, staring at Isai. The dark-haired woman steepled her fingers before her lips in thoughtful concentration. Kobaya could tell she was weighing the arguments that had been given. In frustration, he clenched his fists beneath the table and struggled to remain silent. At last, Isai met Kobaya's eyes and then Nodobi's finally settling on Yum. All right, Yum, she said at last. The council has never set guidelines on how often a captain has to be at sea if they're to be considered master of their ship. I have to admit that you meet all the other requirements. We'll have to clarify the rules, but we can't hold you accountable to laws that haven't been made yet. For now, you're acceptable by all the standards we have in place for Lion's Arch. Welcome to the council. However well-reasoned, her words felt like a slap in the face. Angry, Kobaya pushed away from the table and stood. I think that's enough business for today. At his side, Macha's dark glower matched his tone perfectly. Council is in session for a week. We can meet tomorrow to talk about how we spend yams. Kobaya waved at the bag of money on the table. Regency. The word was bitter. Captain Yom the shopkeep said, gloating. Don't push it, you sniveling rat, hissed Macha, her hand falling to the hilt of a pistol at her belt. The two glared at each other for a moment, and then Yom tossed his head and looked away. Kobaya, Isaye protested. Fine. You made your choice. The vote's done. Pretending not to see Isaye's hurt look, Kobaya turned on his heel and ignored the sputtered arguments behind him. He heard Asai rise from the table. Even Braun reached to stop him. Sorry, Kobe, the Norn said pensively. Times are hard. I need the job to support my children. You understand, yes, my friend? Shoving the Norn's hand from his shoulder, Kobaya marched on. He could hear Macha trotting along behind him multicolored braids flapping across her shoulders as she hurried to keep up. Once they were outside the gate, she grumbled. Was that really necessary? The Tentrumi storming out part? They still have a quorum. They could continue the meeting and you won't be there. They won't continue the meeting. Kobaya took the wide steps of the pavilion, two at a time, and didn't care who was in his path. How can you be so sure? Yom just joined the council. He's not going to want to vote on anything until he knows what's going on, and that means he's going to want exhaustive argument on every issue. That'll take a while. Kobaya's tone lightened a bit, but lost none of its sharpness. 
Trust me. Fair. Macha grunted. Poor Braun. Poor Braun? Kobaya rounded on her, his last nerve frayed raw. That traitorous braggart. I'd like to see him keelhauled. For what? Not wanting to starve? He's a member of my crew. He works my ship. With an unkind laugh, Macha snapped, he was a member of your crew, but he's not now. He has to make money somehow, Kobe. Yom's right about one thing. The pride's always at port. We don't go raiding or adventuring or even pirating. Most of us have jobs on the side. Half the Havoc's old warband work as night guards on the dock, and Sikox spends his time repairing busted-up ships to be used as buildings. He hasn't worked on the Pride's engine in months, but you wouldn't know that. You're always on land, pandering to merchants and planning out the town. Her words stung. What about you, Macha? Have you started taking jobs, too? No. She stiffened brusquely. The only thing I want to do, Colby, is sail with the pride. But you've got to wake up and look around. Macha tugged awkwardly on her bright braids as she rushed to keep up. Tell me something. I heard Sikok say this morning that you were going to ask Aisai to marry you. Is that true? I've thought about it, he answered, puzzled. Why? Is that what's making you so invested in this city? Get married. Settle down. I mean, the way you light up when she comes into port. That big house you're building on the North Shore? You know. The one with the high bedroom and the view of the harbor? Masha's eyes twinkled. You built it for her, didn't you? Love is positively smeared all over your face. I have to sleep somewhere. You used to sleep on the pride, Masha teased. See, Mon? He still didn't answer and Macha's smile faded into genuine curiosity. What if she says no? Kobaya reddened. I don't know. I hadn't really thought about what I'd do then. Kobaya paused to look around, taking in the pleasant streets and freshly painted buildings. Look at this wonderful town we've made, Macha. I say it was a big part of that. Without her, I don't know if I could even live in Lion's Arch. Seeing the city every day without her? It'd remind me too much of what we had. Yeah, Macha nodded, patting his hand. I understand that. Don't worry. Kobaya, I'm sure she'll say yes. What's there to say no about? You're scoundrelous, violent, unpredictable, and utterly incorrigible. He laughed out loud. Thanks, Macha. You wouldn't be able to make it without me, and you know it. We're a team. Narrowing her eyes, she rushed on, changing the subject abruptly. So, Yom has a council seat. What will happen now? Somewhat abashed, Kobaya answered, I guess I should apologize to Isaye. Macha rolled her eyes. That's not what I'm asking, lover boy. Sheesh. You have a mind like a dalyak following a carrot. I'm asking what's going to happen to the city. Kobaya sighed and looked out at the docks. He could see blue water through the jagged spiderwebs of open alleyways, and he could hear the shouts of sailors on the tugs, bringing a clipper into its mooring. Yom's on the council. He gets a vote. Most likely, he'll quell any argument about standardizing prices in the town or bringing in a bank or other shops. He'll fight against anything that could jeopardize his control of trade. He's got enough money to pay off some of the other captains or at least to promise funding for their pet projects if they go along with his ideas. That's bad. Macha worked the figures in her head. If Yom manages to get his way with shipping and sales tariffs, he'll control trade through Lion's Arch. Captains will have to go through him to unload their wares or load new stores aboard their ships. He'll eventually rule Lion's Arch de facto, no matter what the council says. She grabbed Kobaya's sleeve jerking him around to face her. What then, Colby? The little Mesmer's eyes were dark pools of shadow. He'll get greedy, like he always does, and he'll raise prices. Captains won't want to pay his fees. Ships will stop using our port. Kobaya looked down at the bustling docks. 
Lion's Arch will die.